Okay, everybody, um, welcome to another edition of KevCam Night Class, um, you know, co-sponsored by, well, you know who, Solid Cam. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're also sponsored by machinistforsale.com. Uh, there are a couple of uh, different, you know, uh, people that we'd like to thank for this as well. Um, I would like to just uh, uh, announce one thing here. Um, our devoted uh, follower and um, uh, you know professor of uh, solid cam classes tonight is under the weather, uh, so we are working with Mr. Ken Merritt, uh, who is a um, Ken is our senior application engineer, um, chief cook and bottle washer, trade show coordinator, shipper, receiver. Uh, Ken Ken has a Am I going too far? Is that what I'm I think doing? you're going way too far. <laughs> Howdy, everybody. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Ken, uh, you know, Kevin's a little bit under the weather. Um, so we're, what we're going to introduce to you right now is uh, Ken Cam, or, uh, you know, that's going to be, and, and I'm yeah, sure Ken is. Right now. Well, let's leave it at Kev Cam. <laughs> well, you know, just, I mean, you know, you made yourself available, so. Uh, so it's a scary uh, thought, isn't it? It, 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 it kind of is. It kind of is a little bit, but <laughs> but um, certainly, please, uh, you know, appreciate everybody stopping by. Uh, you know, see a lot of familiar people here, uh, and we're we're going to talk a little bit about HSR tonight. And so, as we're going through that, um, just a few things uh, to um, just kind of get us started here. Uh, we're keeping everybody in listen only mode. I think you're. Most of you are very familiar with this, uh, just to eliminate background noise. And if you do have any questions, I'm going to be monitoring those for you. My name is Brendan McKenna. I'm the Eastern Regional Sales Manager for SolidCam. And uh, we'll be sure to make sure that all of those questions get answered uh, as they come up. Uh, again, one more housekeeping item, just to make sure that everybody can see uh, the broadcast. If everybody could just kind of, you know, just give a yes or a no, if you can see the uh, uh, the solid cam, cav cam, night school uh, slide that that we're looking at. Okay, George. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Everybody sees it. Very good. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, what we'd like to do is just kind of start off and talk a little bit about a couple of things that we can offer uh, in terms of what we uh, are, are presenting here tonight. Of course, you know, the KevCam Night School, uh, this is always available to you. It's always free. And what we also will do is we'll have these on YouTube as well. We are recording these sessions. Uh, the other thing is, again, Telefriend, the, the, uh, the Telefriend program, excellent. Excellent starting point here. Um, so if you tell somebody about SolidCam and they decide to uh, purchase a SolidCam seat, you do get a, uh, a reward of up to 20% of the sale of SolidCam. So uh, certainly you know, take a little bit of that. Um, the other thing that you might want to think about is um, we do have a suggestion program where there is a, uh, if you have a topic and you wanted to um, get something uh, on the agenda for us to discuss, we can certainly go ahead and uh, make that happen for you. Uh, so submit your, your topic and you'll get some swag, uh, a hat, a t-shirt, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, we'd be more than happy to show that and feature that in a, a KevCam, up, upcoming KevCam class. So. Um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn this over to Ken Merritt. Uh, again, oh, for those of you, by the way, who are not aware of this, um, uh, Ken Merritt is actually Kevin Rankle's father. So <laughs> That is not true. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wouldn't be ashamed to call him. He's a good kid. <laughs> like him a lot. Well, hey, you know, I had to, how, how else can I segue into that, Ken? I think what you're trying to say is I'm an old man. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe not so much. We got the old you know. dog in today. <laughs> but um, like I said, if there's if there are any questions along the way here, please feel free to ask. Uh, type them into the uh, the questions area, 
we will address those all throughout the presentation. And um, with that being said, Ken, um, why don't we talk a little bit about HSR? Okay, let's do that. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight. I think uh, I think this is going to be kind of fun. We're going to talk a little bit about one of our legacy tool paths for roughing. This is called HSR or high speed roughing. And I'm going to use this little sample file to kind of guide you through it, talk a little bit about how it works. And this is the dialog box. Again, looks just like our, our other dialog boxes. You're going to follow the same workflow through here. Uh, we've got several different options. Uh, HM roughing, which is a hybrid uh, milling type roughing, and contour roughing, hatch roughing, and also a hybrid rib roughing. Now, the one that we find to be probably the most popular is the contour roughing, so we're going to spend our time in that tonight and kind of go through and talk a little bit about the parameter sets in here, how to make this do some special things, and also how to follow it up with an automatic rest machining operation in the next toolpath. So to start with, the geometry selection, like many of our other 3D toolpaths, is simply the actual model. All right. This makes it very, very easy to program because there's no complex selective functionalities. We're going to choose a tool here uh, from our tool library. This is just going to be a 5 sixteenths uh, with a 30 thousandths nose radius bull nose cutter. And we've got that set up for some pretty reasonable feeds and speeds. 4,500 RPM at 30 inches a minute should do a nice job of roughing. Uh, we're looking at this as being a uh, H13 in a pre-hard condition. Hey, Ken. Yes, sir. Uh, just just before you continue on, um, we're getting a couple of comments from the audience. Um, any chance you can reduce your screen resolution? Uh, it looks like the text is a little bit um, uh, difficult to read out. Yeah, I can. Pro let's try that. Um, let's see. And I, I and I appreciate everybody pointing that out. I, I should have asked that from the beginning. So. Um, okay. That's yeah, understandable let's... because you know sometimes the. Um, the computer that, that Ken uses and the one that I use are slightly different. So um, thank you, George, very much for, for pointing that out. Let's see if this gives us a, a clean enough resolution with it um, to apply that. Let's, uh, let's try that. Let's keep those changes, close that, bring that back up. Um, the only downside is I may wind up having to restart. Is that any better? Uh, yeah, could, uh, if we could get a little bit of feedback from the audience, if uh, if that looks better, or if we need to continue to, to adjust there. You seeing any feedback? Uh, not as yet, but on my end, Ken, it looks... Um, looks a little better. You said, uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, two people said a little bit. Different. Okay, let me try one other thing. Sometimes this creates a little bit of glitchiness in the uh, display, but maybe it'll help. Let's take this up to 150%, and that'll raise the size of the text within that resolution. Yeah, I think that might do it, Ken. And that should make things a little bit bigger. Does that help at all? Okay. Okay, so um, are we getting any better resolution there uh, okay. from the audience? Good deal. All righty, so. Perfect. There we go. All right. So okay. as, as we're Sorry going, about that, guys. You know, hey. we, sometimes we, uh, you know, between what I'm running and, and what Ken's running is uh, a little bit different. So perfect. Well, and, and Ken, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow there. No, not at all. Not a problem. This also brings up a perfect opportunity to let you know, um, I'm, I'm, this is a brand new computer for me. I'm working on a Microsoft Surface Book. This is the i7 version with the uh, performance base. And actually, I'm quite impressed with the machine so far, but you guys will get to see kind of a, uh, an example of the performance that this machine gives us. And um, across GoToWebinar, obviously, it was a little bit rough on the eyes with the tighter resolution, but with that 3,000 by 2,000 resolution, Looking at the native graphics screen, this thing is gorgeous. It's really a beautiful screen. Very easy to read, even though the, the text is small. So let's, let's move forward and, and just wanted to 
kind of let you know about that because I'm, I'm still kind of testing the new system. And so far, I'm really liking it. Um, so the tool selection, as we talked about, uh, 5 sixteenths by 30. Constraint boundaries. Now, we have several different ways of defining the constraint boundaries for uh, a cut in here in the HSR. Uh, we can do these through uh, create it automatically, and the system gives us you know, four options here, uh, created by a box around the target, a box around the stock, a silhouette, which would include internal openings, or uh, an outer silhouette only, which would include uh, only the outside shape of the part. Now, um, if we move it over to the created manually, you'll see there are several other options that we can do here. Um, user defined, so you can kind of pick your own geometry, you could create a sketch, you could do whatever you need to do to contain uh, the tool into a specific area. You can also compute shallow areas, uh, silhouetted boundaries, selected faces, uh, tool contact areas based on angle of surface inclination. There's all kinds of different functionality that you can do in here. I'm going to go ahead and stick with the created automatic around the target geometry, and I'll show you what that is. It's just a bounding box of the outer uh, shape of, the, of the, the target. Okay. The other thing that we have the ability to do with our constraint boundaries is define the tool relationship to the constraint boundary. We can use an external boundary like I'm doing where the tool resides outside the boundary. So it's allowed to go outside of it, but it's not allowed to go beyond the boundary. Okay. Now, uh, with that, also you have an offset. This can be a positive or negative value to shift it inside or let it go a little bit further outside as well. And then we also have internal, which of course would be the opposite. We're just going to keep the entire tool inside the boundary. Centered will allow the center of the tool to go out to the boundary. And then of course tangent is great for uh, using ball nose cutters where we can allow it to go out to the point, depending on the surface angle and everything, where the ball is actually in contact with the surface and manage it that way. Um, tonight I'm going to use the external. I think you'll see why. It does a real nice job and it keeps the tool right where we need it. Now the passes page is uh, going to give us a whole lot of parameters here to control how the cut is managed. Um, one of the things that's pretty cool is we can do Z-level ranging. Okay, So in this case, I'm looking at it from 10 thousandths above the part to the bottom of the part. And it computed that automatically. And I do also, of course, have delta offsets for both of those. And those can be positive or negative values to shift it above or below that location should we desire to do that. Setting my wall offset and floor offset at 10 thousandths of an inch. And you can set those at different rates if you want to. If you wanted to have an asymmetric shift offset, you can do that. Um, the tolerance for roughing, I've got this set to a thousandth of an inch tolerance. This is the chordal deviation tolerance over the surfacing. Now, something to be aware of on this, just to kind of give everybody a hint. Um, tolerance can be something that seriously impacts the compute time. Okay. Um, when we're working with really, really tight tolerances over complex surfaces, it creates a lot of triangles that we have to slice. And so it, it kind of exponentially increases the computational time. Doesn't necessarily do you a whole lot of good in a roughing operation because, of course, you know, we're leaving 10 thousandths of stock on this, right? So we really don't need to be any tighter than a thousandths or two thousandths for a roughing operation. And that's going to leave a little bit of a rough cut. It's, it's going to be faceted, but that's OK, because we're going to come back and finish it with a finishing process anyway. So things to think about. You can really optimize the calculation time by keeping this at a reasonable value. I do see some people sometimes drop this clear down to a tenth, and that's just not necessary. It just over overcomplicates the calculation. It doesn't really gain you much of anything. Step down, we're going to use one times the diameter of the tool. A little bit over that, because uh, we're using a, a 5 16th, so we're a little bit deeper. Um, minimum offset. Minimum offset is uh, the value that the tool will offset between passes. What's the minimum step over that it's going to take? From that, the system automatically computes what a maximum offset will be also. 
The smoothing algorithm allows us to take some of the jaggedness of the faceting out of it and sort of smooth those curves around, creating a nicer connection points as well. Detect cores is a very interesting option. Um, the idea behind the detect core is in an area like this, uh, a typical pocketing routine, the tool might set down right on top of this and begin working its way out to the outside. When we turn on detect cores, it's going to detect that this is a convex shape and that it can start out here and work its way into this instead of starting in the middle and pocketing out from it. And so it gives us more of a uh, outside to inside approach style and it can be very beneficial when you're working with a core body. Um, now, if you're working with a completely contained cavity model, then of course detect core is not going to do anything for you, so there's no need to run it through that extra computation. If you're working with something that has both cavities and core areas, turning on the detect core is again going to give you that outside to inside when that makes sense, but of course it'll run the inside to outside when it finds itself within a cavity region. Okay. We also have some parameters that you can assign for the smoothing. And we have an adaptive step down. Now in this case, for this first operation, one of the things that I like to do is turn the adaptive step down off because I just want to kind of get rid of the main body of stock around this, this part. I don't want it to take adaptive steps coming all the way in from the outside to the surfaces. So I'm going to go ahead and run this with the adaptive step turned off, and then we'll follow it up with another one here shortly uh, where we turn that on. I'll show you how that works. Now on our link page, we have many different options in here for controlling the motion of the tool uh, relative to several different uh, features and functions of, of, the, of, of this toolpath, this operation. We can force it into a climb milling only if we want to. Um, if we're using tools that are okay with going back and forth, a bidirectional is pretty clean. I'm going to leave it in bidirectional tonight so that you can see the tool motion instead of seeing a lot of repositioning moves. And it'll kind of help you get an idea around uh, what the tool motion is going to be. Just remember if you put it into climb only, or conventional only if you needed that for some reason. Climb only would be a very common setting. It's going to make a cut, reposition, and make another cut. It makes it a little harder to see the actual toolpath underneath it, but it's generally the way people are going to run it. We also have the option of minimizing uh, full width cuts in here, which will force it to, instead of slotting into an area and then starting its collapse patterns out from that, it'll actually whittle its way into those areas, keeping the area a little bit more open and minimizing the amount of full width cuts that the software would, would do. Now, I also like the link by area check mark because this gives me an ability to um, work within a particular area before moving to another area. And that way you can kind of optimize all those reposition moves, especially when you're in the climb mode it's kind of nice to keep it contained in a particular area until you get rid of the material in that area, then move to another region that's an encapsulated region and, and work in that area again. Okay. Um, some of these others have various reasons. The link by Z level, if you're working with some thin wall stuff, you're going to want to do the link by Z level so that it alternates from one side of the thin wall to the other for each step down. That keeps the rigidity of the wall there while you're roughing. So those are some things to think about as well. In our ramping tab, we have the ability to control how the tool is going to ramp into an area that's like a cavity area. We can also control the ramp height, uh, how high it's going to come in from. So depending on how much stock you've got in particular areas uh, or how close you want it to be before it actually starts cutting, some people like to keep it up in the air a little bit so they see it coming down and, and it's not getting in there too quick for them. In this case, we're going to use a helical ramp and we also have the ability to control that helix diameter. Now the strategies tab gives us uh, several different parameters that are going to give us some unique control over the toolpath. And you can see by these pictures kind of what these parameters are controlling. So this is the stay on surface within and 
if it's got to move across a gap that's greater than that value, it's going to do a repositioning move for it. If that gap is within the stated value, then it'll just continue and stay on the cut and stay in feed rate mode as it crosses over that gap. The linking radius is going to be what size of a radius it's going to use when it's moving from pass to pass within a particular slice. And it keeps this, you'll see when we generate the toolpath on this, you'll see that it's all very, very smooth motion from one pass to another, making for nice, smooth, clean motion on your machine, no jerky motion that would be damaging to uh, you know, the ball screws and the servo drives. The link clearance is, again, one of those parameters that allows it to, when it's doing a linking move, how far does it clear away from the part while it's making that relink move. Okay, and then our retracts page gives us some capabilities in here that are very interesting. We have several different types of retracts. The shortest retract is the one that I like to call terrain following, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to utilize these parameter sets over here to determine how closely it follows the contours and what types of um, rise off curves and, and enter back in curves it uses to smooth out that tool pass. And, and you can see you can set these sizes for each one of these parameters and know what they do. Now, by the way, while we're in here, you know, these pictures are great and they really give you a sense and an understanding of what this parameter is controlling. But if you'd like to get some more information, push the question mark, put your cursor in there and you can read up on what that parameter controls and how it is is managed by the system. Okay. Excellent. You know, and, and Ken, if, if I could just maybe just slightly interrupt here. Sure. Um, maybe not to put you so much on the spot, but um, the, the the ramping or uh, the helical entry into this toolpath. Mm -hmm. um, do you happen to have that video of that that cutter that we were talking about? <laughs> Remember that? Because people the love this. The and, crazy one. <laughs> yeah, the like when we were trying to make the cutter break and it wouldn't break. Uh, yeah, we can show that. <laughs> Let's show that after we get through this. That one's kind of okay. crazy. Okay. Okay. Cool. I'm yeah, not I've trying got, to throw you no, off. That's but, okay. I've got that video, and that's a fun video. I tell you guys, awesome. you're gonna love this. We okay. have a ball with it. Very cool. But yeah, we we Very can go cool. into that later on. Perfect. Um, getting back into this one, although uh, we we still have another page here. We want to talk about the leads. Okay, and these are vertical leads as well as horizontal leads. And let me go ahead and turn the toolpath on for you so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. These are going to be these lead moves here and the lead moves in here. Okay, so again, lots and lots of control over how this is generated. Now, I've left these at the default values. One of the things that's very, very powerful about the HSR system, um, there's a lot of parameters here. Okay, and sometimes this stuff can get kind of confusing until you get used to it. But there's a really cool feature in that you can right click in any one of these parameter boxes and you can do a reset of this parameter, this page, or all the parameters within this operation. So if you do get something out of balance and it won't calculate properly for you or it calculates some goofy move or whatever, you can simply come back and reset everything and start working your way through them again until you better understand what that parameter is controlling. Now, again, one of the optimum features of SolidCam is that once you get it set up the way you want it, we can save that as a template. So by default, most of our operations will run very effectively with their default settings. They might not be as efficient as you can make them by tweaking them a little bit, but they will generally do a good job of cutting the, the part. After you go through here and optimize all this stuff, then you'll be able to decide what you do and don't like, go ahead and capture that as a template, and you can even assign those as a default template for this style of operation so that every time you choose this HSR type operation, it's going to come in with those settings automatically assigned for it. And it's, you know, Ken, that's such a great, you know, it's such a great feature because, you know, again, you don't have to go back and put all those parameters in, you know, set up the coordinate system, exactly. all that sort of stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. it's already there. You can even capture tool information. It's really pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Totally cool.
Okay, motion control we probably don't need to get into. You can you can break out uh, arcs by lines if necessary. You can do some interpolation distance functions. Um, a lot of this stuff is very, very powerful in the HSM finishing operations. Um, in general, I don't usually use these in the HSRs because eh, I'm roughing. And it's going to be a coarse toolpath anyway. So I really don't care about you know trying to control interpolation distances. And these just have a tendency to impact um, the calculation time for the toolpath. So we're not going to worry about those. Of course, miscellaneous parameters, you can put messages in here and you guys probably know that this area is used for um, post-processor triggers, okay? So you can turn those on when you need them as well. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and step out of this and um, show you a little bit here. Yes. Um, so we see the toolpath here, and we can see, you know, the levels that it's running. It's course step down, all right? And if we put that into simulation, uh, kind of like the solid verifies, a real nice way of taking a look at this and seeing how it cuts. So that's going to load up our target block. And then, of course, uh, let me move some things around here. The changing of the resolution shifted some of my dialogues. Um, we go ahead and cut that, and let me slow that down a little bit so you can kind of see the toolpath. You can see how the tool is moving uh, from pass to pass, nice and smooth with rounded corners so that your machine is not jerking around. You're not putting that extra stress and load on your ball screws and the servo drives. Okay, And so you can kind of see I did a very coarse job of roughing that out, getting most of the material out of there uh, and ready for the next operation. Now, one of the things we do, and I did in this case, is I just simply did a save and copy when I was done with that. That save and copy put this toolpath in the tree automatically for me with all of those parameters already preset, and the only thing I needed to do was come in here and switch it to the rest roughing, okay? Now, based on it being a rest roughing operation, as we start looking at the geometry, notice again, facet tolerances are tight, or you know, are not too tight, excuse me. Tool is the same tool in this case. Uh, I'm using the exact same size tool to do resting because I want to remove those staircases and make them much more refined. Same constraint boundary because it came in from the other toolpath. Same variables and values here as came in, except that I'm changing the step down. Instead of being 375,000 step down, I'm using a 30,000 step down. Okay, and then everything else is pretty much the same. What that gave me, and I was going to let you see on this one. Now this is a fairly complex um, toolpath alignment. So when I go in here. I want you to see it's automatically calculating the stock definition, what's left. Let's go ahead and take a look at what it sees. Basically, it's the same thing as what it showed you in the, um, the simulation toolpath. Uh -oh. Something happened here. Even, even the great ones, Ken. Even uh, the great ones. I think I got click happy. <laughs> Okay. Okay. It showed it. There we go. All right. So it showed you the uh, toolpath it computes at, and, and it knows, and it uses this to determine its boundaries of where it's going to begin machining from. So you're not, in this operation, you're not going to waste any time just machining open air. Okay. And so now that I've got all that set up, let's go ahead and calculate this and kind of give you an idea of the sense of the calculation time. This is a uh, five by seven block. Um, and let's go ahead and run that calc. Okay, and you can see the performance. And again, this is on a Surface Book i7 uh, with 16 gigs of RAM and the uh, performance base, which has the NVIDIA graphics card in it. And we're already into the contour linking. And by the way, that was also calculating the minimum tool length. Let me show you. I should have talked about that a little bit. I've turned on the minim calculate minimum tool length. So the system gives you a read back on what the minimum tool extension needs to be for this to be a successful operation. Okay, kind of a neat feature in there. It takes a little yeah, longer you know, to calculate that too. So you got to see that in that calculation process. Sure, sure. You know, and, and Ken, you know, if I can just kind of jump in there real quick. Um, you know, for those of you who are doing a little bit more uh, complex 
toolpath calculation, um, there's a feature that that's available within SolidCam that a lot of people don't really take advantage of, which is multi-core processing. And Ken, can you talk a little bit about that just real quick before oh, sure. we move on? You betcha. Um, the multi-core processing allows us to do a lot of things simultaneously. So for instance, you might take, uh, it, let's say you're working with templates, you might want to program up three or four operations that are not dependent on each other and instead of doing a save and calculate between each one just do a save and move on to the next one save move on to the next one save move on to the next one then you can come back and grab all three four or five however many of them you want and do a parallel processing and it will spread whatever calculations it can across the multiple cores in the system to do simultaneous multi-threading and and bring that all back in, in a quicker fashion than doing each one individually in sequence. Okay, so that and, can be and by the way, very, very nice feature. Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, definitely not uh, not only a nice feature. Um, it's free. It's included. Yeah, yeah it's so, included in the system. So right. So and not a lot of people know that. So uh, you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> so as you can see here, um, this has brought us to a near net finish by simply doing two operations. And, and one of the things that I did in here, just to kind of give you guys an idea, is remember I brought the step down, down to 30 thousandths. Well, it's not having to do that from the outside in all the way, because within the passes, I told it I wanted to use automatically insert extra passes as a adaptive step down. And so it's gonna actually look at all of the features and it's gonna force itself into this precision and step down profile and make sure that there are no staircases anywhere on this model that are greater than this functionality here based on the number that you put in here. And so that gives us, and it also controls it to a minimum step down so it doesn't refine it too much, okay? Because if the vertical step is less than 15 thousandths, maybe the horizontal step over is not that big a deal. And so you can kind of control the amount of flex and unflex that the finishing tool is going to see based on more or less um, creating a continuity between these staircases. Okay. Now, there's some other things that people like to do too using the, the traditional legacy style toolpaths, and that is the what we what we like to call the old school high speed machining. Okay. And in that, in high-speed machining, as long as your step-down is not greater than half the nose radius of the tool, you can really get some pretty efficient tool paths out of just stepping down real shallow and spinning her fast and moving her fast. Okay, So I want to show you just kind of a, a reference here. These are these two operations that we just did. And we're going to simulate those just in HostCAD next to each other or with each other so that you can kind of see what that time frame is. And you'll see we're looking at um, about an hour and 15 minutes of actual cut time in this H13 pre-hard condition. Okay, And that's using some pretty reasonable feeds and speeds that, that most people on a fairly decent machine could probably get away with. Now I want to take this over to the next style of cut still using the same contour roughing mode. Adaptive step is turned off. Tool is a 375, but this time it's got an 060 nose radius instead of an 030. So that'll let me take a little bit deeper step without violating that half of the um, nose radius. Now, I want to kind of talk a little bit about that and show you what I mean by that. Um, if you've got the nose radius of the tool like this, as long as your step is below the half point, the actual pressure vector on the tool is more in this direction instead of being in this direction here. And that tool can sustain that pressure vector much, much better because it's pushing it directly up the z-axis of the machine instead of bending the tool sideways. And so you can get a lot more aggressive with your cutting speeds and feeds using this methodology than you would with a traditional style toolpath. Okay? And so as you'll notice in here, 
I'm able to run a 6,000 RPM cut at 200 inches a minute, and that tool will survive very well doing that. Okay. Now, this tool path, as you'll see, um, calculation time is about the same as the others would be. Okay. It's going to compute through here. I'll let you kind of see how it runs. It runs pretty quick through here. You know, yeah, Ken, another great example of, you know, the uh, processing time of that, you know, Microsoft book that you have. That's I have one myself. I love it. It's oh, fantastic. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic machine, and, and it really runs nice. Um, but this is going to generate a lot of toolpath. Okay. Now, the cycle time on this, remember we were an hour and 15 plus minutes the other way. The cycle time on this one, and this is running a bunch of toolpath down this thing, but we're doing it much faster with less stress, or I should say less linear side load stress on the tool than we would be in the other way, and we achieved a minute and four seconds. So we gained eh, about 11 minutes of cycle time on this. And remember, in this previous operation, I'm pushing a little bit more than one diameter depth of cut because I'm on a smaller tool, but I'm pushing, you know, I'm three, uh, 312 on the diameter, I'm pushing 375 on the depth, and I'm running at 4,530 inches a minute. That's going to be a pretty tough load on that tool, okay? Uh, you're not going to get a whole lot more out of that, and you're going to have to use kind of a premium tool to do that using it the other way. So we really actually, in some cases, may need to slow this down a little bit. So we might see something in the hour and 20 minute range or something like that for a cycle time on this. Whereas this one here, that hour and four minutes is going to be pretty stable. It's going to be pretty consistent. Okay. Um, are you seeing any questions at this point, Brendan, before we go any further? Do we want to kind of open it up a little bit and, and see what people well, are thinking? I, I think maybe, you know, one question that we had was, um, you know, there's there are some people who have seen iMachining and, um, you know, maybe kind of, you know, just kind of looking at that going, well, you know, what is the, you know, the biggest difference? And um, I think maybe it should be talked about just a little bit. Um, we don't have to spend a ton of time on it, but you know, again, I think really one of the one of the biggest things that um, if you don't have eye machining and there's uh, a need for bulk material removal, uh, this is really where you know this this product really shines. And I think you know everything that Ken has shown up to this point has been very traditional, and a lot of people who don't maybe. Um, it, it, it's an interesting way to try to describe this, but a lot of people are somewhat intimidated by eye machining and the the material removal rates that we have. So um, you know, some people might be just a little you know kind of you know timid about that and you know things like that. But a little more um, comfortable with this method, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the other you know, thing I would say this this probably also has a little more application for people that are more used to the old school thought process of of um, you know high speed material removal uh, feed milling. Okay, uh, if you're thinking about a feed milling strategy and that's what you're comfortable with, then this HSR can give you a very very good vehicle for doing that. And as we showed here, um, if you get a high-end feed mill, um, then we could take, and this is where this kind of really gets into it, um, if we can get a little bit more speed out of this, for instance, if your machine has the characteristics and the capabilities of doing this, with a good quality high feed mill, you could probably take this on a, this is um, this is using a 3 8 inch, so you could probably go in the neighborhood of 11,000 RPM, and you could do that easily at about five thousandths chip thickness. And if you were to get a multi-flute tool, you're going to increase your feed rate quite a bit um, and kick this up, you know, even higher. So, um, you know, even even if you were able to get this up to like six thousandths per chip thickness, um, you're, you're pushing that feed rate up further and further and further. 
um, to get you where you need to be. And so at, um, let me get back to where I was here, at, at 5 thousandths, um, let's take this up to 11 thousand, oops. And that's gonna put our feed rate in that 220 range. Hmm, why did that switch back on me there? Interesting. Um, okay, let's go there and let's calculate this. You know, and, and, and Ken, is it is it fair to say that um, the you know the tooling, the fixturing, uh, you know, the, the strength of all of that would would have a lot to do with this tool path as well, or? It can, yeah, it can. Uh, the quality of the tool can impact it. Lots of different things. Um, just so you get kind of a, ah, I forget to, forgot to suppress the others. Hang on a second. Let me put these two into suppression yeah, mode. Yeah, you know, listen, it, you know, Ken, this is this is Kevcam. They're they're going to call you out. So. <laughs> I know. I, I know. just um, I just had a guy, uh, Ronnie, just called out. Hey, it stayed at six k. So. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. You can't, you can't get anything going past. on there, and I'm not sure what I'm going to have to check into that one. But the idea behind this, you can kind of see, this takes down very thin passes, and just works its way down creating that shape in a very, very near net condition. Um, this can be a very, very powerful way of doing toolpath. But again, you're going to be looking at, you know, a, a pretty significant amount of time on this toolpath. Okay. Um, why it switched back to six, I don't know. Kicking it up to 11,000 and 6,000 uh, chip thickness, we're probably going to get more into the uh, 40 minutes time, time frame doing something like that. Um, and so, again, different ways of doing things. Now, um, let me go ahead and suppress this one because you brought up the idea of doing uh, eye machining. For those of you oh. who do not have eye machining, this can be a very valuable feature to have in your system. So you may want to consider uh, the option of upgrading to this. Um, you were going to say something, Brennan? Oh, you know, you know, again, Ken, just uh, not to interrupt at all, but, you know, I mean, there are, you know, we, we have so many customers out there who run different levels of solid cam. So it could be, you know, two and a half feet standard. It could be two and a half feet pro. Um, you may or may not have a machine that, you know, you think that could support this type of machining. Mm -hmm. But, again, a lot of people, when when they realize the amount of material removal that they can achieve with eye machining from solid cam, um, they really do become intimidated at some point because be, yeah. they're like, well, it, I mean, am I right, Ken? I mean, I really think that's that's a correct statement because, you know, look at the, you know, look at the YouTube videos that are out there. All you have to do is go on YouTube and search eye machining solid cam mm -hmm. and you see, like, I mean, Ken, they're machining titanium at at the rate in w at which they could machine aluminum. You know, well, nobody. Not quite, but <laughs> well, <laughs> but like steel. You know, but it's 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 like it's most people close. are machining steel. They're cutting titanium at those rates, and it's pretty okay. crazy. Okay, well, you know me. I I like to get a little excited, yeah, but know. you're you know. an <laughs> kind of an excitable kind of guy. You know. Well, I, anyway, but but that's the but that's really the whole thing. You know, and and so when you look at some of these tool paths, and you know, maybe Ken can sort of like, you know, contrast and in, in, in translate, or um, you know, some of these these other, you know, these other tool paths that we've been sure. looking at. Sure, sure. Let me let me show you what we're doing here. This um, eye machining is very very easy to set up, and so it gives us another way of doing. This is our three D general, so it's it's again, the geometry selection here was very simple. It's just the entire model. Okay, no, no craziness. Um, not even using a working area. Didn't turn it on. It just knows where the model is. That's why I had to suppress these others because it has to see the previous condition of the model in order to appropriately uh, do that machining. Using that same five sixteenths tool, same set of levels. The technology wizard gives us the ability to go from very, very conservative all the way up through any level here of increasing the aggression level 
Notice the feeds and speeds here are dramatically different than what you might see in a normal type of a cut. And, and we're looking at this. Um, the depth of cut in this is 600 thousandths. So we're over two times the diameter in depth of cut, and yet we're able to run at almost 10,000 RPM and 130 inches a minute. Um, and if we wanted to look at that in, in this way, we're 800 surface feet and um, two and a half thousandths chip thickness at the cutting angle, okay? And we're using a 50 degree cutting angle. Now doing it this way, leaving that same thousands, 10, you know, 10 thousandths of stock and a 30 thousandths scallop step for this, okay? So we get a real nice uh, near net surface finish. This actually generates a tool path. Let's go ahead and turn this off for you. And take a look at that. Different approach. Slow this down just a little bit so you can kind of watch it at first. It's going to work its way around at the heavy depths. Okay. We'll speed that up just a little bit so you can kind of see it. So it's going to carve around all those areas, never over engaging the tool. And therefore, we can run much, much faster. And then it's just going to automatically staircase up in between its areas. So not only a much faster tool bath, but a much more efficient motion of the tool in how it creates the staircase reduction. Okay. Well, you know, and I think, Ken, you know, that's really sort of the uh, kind of the objective, right, is to remove, you know, more material at a, at a, at a deeper depth right. and yeah and have that you know when it comes back and, and you always talk about not having to you know perhaps have that semi finish you know tool path so yeah in many really cases you can get away going straight to a finishing tool sure. and, and this is what you were talking about people being intimidated this is where they get intimidated this is an 18 minute tool path okay well now, you know, good point. And a lot of people um, tend to not believe that. And so I want to show you something. Um, let's take this tool path here. This is, this is an eye machining tool path in 304 stainless steel. Okay, and we're running on a Herco 5 axis machine. So we're, you know, we've, we've got a trunnion set up in here. Um, not the most rigid setup available. This is a 3 8 inch diameter tool and you can see how fast it is removing the material. I hope that's showing up on your side uh, fairly smooth anyway. But you can kind of see with the timeline down here, we're 25 seconds into it, and we've already taken a whole bunch of material off this thing. Um, let me go ahead and ramp this forward just a little bit for you, because I want you to see something here when it, when it dives into the middle. We're at a minute and five seconds into this now, and you can see how much material it's taken off of that. And as it comes around this front side, you'll see it start working the staircasing here and, and minimizing that, uh, that roughness, if you will. So at each step, as it's taking the roughing stock off, it's also walking its way up the surfaces so that it creates that, that minimum staircasing. Okay, let's go a little sure. bit further forward here. We're going to helix in, and this is not the one we were talking about. This is a standard uh, two, two and a half degree helix. Um, running about 8,000 RPM, 80 inches a minute, and, and he, just helixing in. And again, guys, this is 304 stainless steel dry with just air blast on it, okay? We can do this with eye machining because we're not overloading the tool, and we're not stressing the tool in a linear fashion, and therefore we can remove the chip much easier and generate a lot less heat, okay? I just... You know, Ken, I, I just have to interject just very quickly. I know you're, you're like, oh, you know, this is just a standard, you know, two-degree helix and, you know, to forward 10 stainless, you know, whatever. Like, you talk about that like it's so, you know, nonchalant. But, <laughs> you know, like we do this all the time. We do this we with do. all these different materials. <laughs> and, you know, it's hilarious. You know, Ken is just so, you know, he's very conservative, but, you know, I, Ken, could, could you show that video? Could you show the one? Oh, yeah, the, the diver? Yeah. Let's I mean, take a look at that. Um, this is huge, huge. This, this is kind of crazy. This is one of our favorite videos. Tooling 
and, and let me let me kind of balance what we're talking about here. Um, I machining and and the way solid cam drives the tool is really the key behind the whole thing. Okay, because of the way we manage the tool. But in addition to that, you can gain a little bit more with good equipment, good tooling, good tool holding. This is a Rego Fix power grip holding system. This is a, a, a Goering RF100 diver end mill. And this, of course, is on the, uh, the Herco machine. Now, this is the one that Brendan loves because of the Helix. So let's go ahead and watch this and watch it Helix in. Now, this is a 3 8 inch tool. This is going to be in 1018 cold roll steel. So fairly easy to cut material, but it is steel. And as you can see here, we're going to helix in at, at 25 degrees helical angle. We go 750 thousandths deep in about four seconds. Okay. And it doesn't hurt the tool a bit. This tool is just purring. It loves this Perfect. treatment. And well, you know, and, watch and it again. Can, here we are. Would, would you mind if I kind of took a little bit of a, you know, not to steal your thunder, but so um, myself and, and uh, Ken, uh, Kevin Rankle were on this call, and we were watching this, and, and uh, Ken's, going, Ken's going, can you believe this? And we're going, we're like, push it harder. Yeah, push well, it I was harder. At, I was at 15 <laughs> degrees helical angle, and I was amazed with how it was running. And they're like, take it to 20. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just want to see a tool break, don't you? <laughs> and, and Ken, poor Ken, was just going. He's like, he's like, guys, no, we can't, you know. And he's like, and we're like, just do it, just do now, it. And the, he, <laughs> the Goering technicians are telling me that we can run this at 30 degrees helical angle. Now realize too that again, I'm running this at 8,000 RPM and 60 inches a minute at 25 degrees helical angle. Don't try to do that with a typical tool. Okay, but you can see it it doesn't phase it. It's amazing what it does. So yeah, this is kind of fun. I, I love getting in here and doing this kind of stuff, but the more you experiment, and I don't recommend people running production at this level. I mean, come on, let's be serious. We're doing things to test the software, to test the tooling, test the work holding, test the tool holding. Uh, and see kind of where those limits are, okay? But as you can see here, you know, we've run two and a half minutes worth of cut on this thing in steel, created six nice little pockets, and when I pulled this out and looked at it, the tool looks beautiful. Look at that tool. There's, there's no coloration on it. There's no microchipping on it. I pulled this thing out. It's dead sharp. The, the, the corner radiuses down here weren't, weren't even colored, okay? So I didn't even burn the, the coating on them. Um, so you can get away with a lot of things. Um, I, I don't recommend going to this level out of the gate. Work your way up to it and find that area that is gonna balance cycle time versus tool life, okay? And in yeah. your shop, with your machine, with your fixturing setup, you're gonna have to determine that where that is and that's what the slider's for. Exactly. You know, and, and Ken, honestly, that's what the, that's what tonight's presentation really was all about, is, is bringing you from traditional roughing toolpaths to, okay, you know, maybe you might want to take a look at iMachining and see what that can do for you. And, you know, maybe exploring some new tooling. We're not, you know, again, we're not trying to sell you tooling, but you know, there there are a lot of strategies out there that could really make this, you know, make things work so much more quickly for you, and you could be so much more productive. So, right. you know, these things are, you know, this is why we talk about all this stuff, because, you know, maybe somebody might look at this and, and you know, initially what we're saying, like, okay, it could be, you know, maybe it's a little bit more on the traditional side, that's okay. But when you look at everything else that you're kind of exploring and the, the other, you know, products you have access to, this is, uh, you know, this is some seriously cool stuff. And you can, you know, just completely. Hey, I'm noticing, I'm noticing a question in here. Um, sure. How hot was the tool? Um, guys, that is the mind-blowing thing about this. 
Um, that Great tool question. was that yeah. tool was pretty warm when I got done with those six cuts. It was, I bet it was in the 135, 140 degree range. I couldn't comfortably hold on to it, but I could reach in and grab it and just you know kind of move my fingers on and off of it. And within 20 seconds, I could hold it. Okay. It was not scalding. I know it was kind of weird going in because it looked like it was glowing red. Those were the chips. The chips that were well, coming out were glowing red, not the tool. But in, you know, but Ken, that's the whole point, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, exactly. remove the heat through the chip rather than the tool. Rather than the so. tool. And it, it's kind of surprising to people um, that 304 stainless that we were cutting, that was using a, a, a GW Schultz HGW series tool. Uh, again, a four flute tool. It doesn't helix like the like the driver or the diver, but it goes in at three degrees. And, you know, like I said, uh, I think I was at 8,080 on that one. Um, after that whole cut on that 17 or on that, on that 304 stainless steel. And again, that was a four by six block of stainless steel that was the uh, inch and a quarter thick, removed all that material in Oh, I want to say it was in the neighborhood of 17 minutes, maybe less than that. Let me, let me go look real quick. Um, we ramped this all the way to the top here. Yeah, we're looking, oh, seven minutes. Yeah, seven minutes we took all that material out of there, okay? And the tool was room temperature. I, I, I could immediately reach in and grab a hold of it, and it wasn't even warm. Okay, so it, it's pretty amazing what you can do with this stuff um, as you begin to explore. Don't be afraid to explore. And, and I'll, I'll throw the I'll throw the disclaimer out there. Look, if you get too crazy too quick, you're going to break something. You're going to break tools. Um, I like to start out my exploration with smaller tools. I like to go down to like a quarter inch tool and do my exploration there because if I snap a quarter inch tool off, I'm not going to hurt my spindle bearings. Okay. Sure. I put a one inch tool in there and start exploring and snap a one inch tool. And I could be damaging my spindle at that point. Don't want to do that. You want to kind of get your knowledge base on the smaller tools. Of course, they're a lot less expensive too. <laughs> we don't want to be snapping sure. one inch tools off. Those are expensive. You can buy quarter inch tools for 30 bucks a piece. If you snap one off, it's no big deal. You learn something, okay? But if you start lower on the wizard and work your way up to what feels comfortable to you, over time you will begin to understand more about eye machining and how it works, and you'll find your comfort level. And it's going to be a different comfort level for everybody. You're going to have, you know, machine characteristics. You're going to have the tool you choose. You're going to have the, the, the tool holder that you choose. A lot of people try to do some of this stuff with ER32 collets. I go to the power grip system because it's one of the best tool holding systems on the market. It, it is true run out. Uh, they guarantee, I want to say it's uh, three microns at four times the diameter out of the collet. Okay. If that tool is running dead on center, each flute is doing the same amount of work. The load on the tool is very uniform around the tool. And so it becomes a, a very comfortable way to run that tool. By the way, uh, when this was running uh, in this stainless steel here, at that rate that I was running at, the spindle load meter was only running about 25%. You know, uh, Ken, speaking of that, um, just maybe, you know, I, and I know um, <laughs> this is not one of our more, you know, prolific videos, but um, would you mind showing the Colorado video just real quick before oh, we yeah, wrap yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Before, yeah, we get running out of time here, but yeah, I can show that. Um, yeah, we got we got about a minute or two here, um, but the reason why I'm asking Ken to do this, um, Ken went up to a, a, a customer of ours up in Colorado and uh, had a, a, a Haas uh, tool room mill. Uh, I think it was like an 80s series oh or so. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thing was yeah, <laughs> Penozoic age. <laughs> well, and I and I don't want to steal your thunder here, Ken. But um, you know, the story here is great because um, you know the the pocket on the left hand side, 
uh, took about what was it four four twenty seven four hours and twenty seven no, minutes. No, 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 um, not quite that bad. It was this this pocket over here. He cut traditional way. By the way, he's using he's using a very good tool in here. He's using one of the OSG uh, Exocarb thirty one fifties. It's about a sixty dollar tool for a three eighth inch tool. Um, three fluter and he cut this side over here the best he could get out of the machine using traditional tool path was 2200 rpm uh, 18 inches a minute okay and 50,000 step down and so this pocket being an inch deep took him two hours and 26 minutes to cut it by the time oh, I'm he sorry, got it I, I I forgot. I thought it was. I thought yeah, it was no, more than that. no. We did the. I think you're thinking of the four pockets. Was where your four came from. Right. Um, sure. We did 200 uh, or two hours 26 minutes to cut this, and by the time it got to the bottom, the bottom 50 thousandths of the tool was completely worn. Couldn't do any more cutting with it, and it had left striation marks all the way down the wall. So he had to come in with a brand new tool and do a finish pass on this to clean it up. Now this machine's only got 4,500 RPM spindle, and as you can see. It kind of jumps around a little bit in here because it'll only give me about 50 inches a minute of feed rate before it starts getting into data starvation and it actually starts pausing and hesitating, waiting for the controller to catch up to where it's at. And so what I did, we're running this at full depth of cut though. We're full one inch deep on a 3 8 inch end mill. And so you can see it's not a real sexy video, but let's move it up here a little bit and you can see, look at the chip color. Chip color is gorgeous. We got most of this cut out of here. Let's keep moving it up here a little bit. Get over here to the end, okay? And I th and again, I just want to remind people who are watching this. Um, you know, keep keep on the left, the bottom left hand side of this video. This is not sped up. This is no, no, no. you know, yeah. This is you real can time. see it. It's it's yeah. seven. Yeah, this is very real time. Yeah. So seven think, minutes and twenty six seconds to complete this pocket, okay? And the color of the chip was gorgeous. We pulled this tool out and looked at it under a 3XI loop, and you could not tell that it was a used tool. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I wiped it off with a rag and acetone and everything. There wasn't even any scuffing on the coating. Even in the ejection galley, there was nothing. The corners on the end of, the, of this tool were not even, dis, not even discolored in any slight way. I mean, it looked like an absolutely brand new tool. Now, I, I put it back in. We cut three more pockets on here for a total of four pockets this way. And at the end of the fourth pocket, there was a shine mark down the cutting edge of the flute where it had kind of worn the, the coating off of it. And inside the ejection galley of the flute, you could see where you were starting to see the abrasion uh, tearing the coating off from the, the chip's moving their way through there. And the chips were getting a little bit darker. They were more into an auburn color, a little bit darker gold than this. But again, razor sharp. And so how many pockets could we have got out of it? I don't really know because we stopped at four. That was enough to prove to him that it was better. He was only getting one pocket per tool. I got four pockets out of one tool and seven minutes, 26 seconds per pocket instead of two hours, 26 minutes per pocket. Yeah. Probably could have got about eight pockets, maybe even as many as ten out of that one tool. Perfect, perfect. You know, Ken, um, the the one last question that we have here is, um, mm -hmm. could you could you discuss the importance of runout um, in terms of uh, tooling, spindle, you know, that kind of thing? Uh, highly important. Um, any runout is going to generate harmonics. Number one. Um, number two, anytime you have run out, at whatever level you have run out, you are creating a non-uniform uh, stress or load on the tool. Uh, one flute might be taken two thousandths chip, the next one might be taken five tenths if you've got a thousand and a half run out, and the one in between could be taken you know one and eight tenths or something. So they're all taking a different load. Therefore, you're creating a different stress dynamic around the tool and causing that tool to stress out. What, think about carbide. What's the worst thing you can do to carbide is shock it, whether that's vibrational shock, thermal shock, impact shock. Anytime you shock carbide, you stand the chance of fracturing the substrate and causing it to break down a microchip. 
Okay, so run out is extremely important because of that uniformity in the stress load. Perfect. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, another question here, Ken. Uh, in HSR, if you are using a tool that cannot tolerate any type of ramping, uh, can you prevent the tool from ramping? Um, yeah, you'd have to pre-drill your entry points if you had cavity okay. entry points. If you're using like the part I was on where it was a core, um, other than the one cavity area up on the top, uh, pretty much everything else is going to come in from off the material. So you wouldn't sure. have a problem with ramping. Right. Um, in general, what I would say is um, target tools that you can ramp with. Um, one of the things that people do, and it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon that I see throughout the industry, People get very comfortable with a particular tool and don't want to change. Um, I recommend you take a look. I mean, we work with several tool vendors. Okay, we work with uh, GW Schultz, we work with Guring, we work with Seco, uh, I work with Ultra Tool, um, I work with uh, MA Ford is another one of them, um, Emco. We work with several tool vendors because we want to check. The, the functionality of iMachine across a wide variety of tools. We don't want to get into a situation where it's only because of the tool that we can perform. Okay, and so we cross-check everything against multiple different types of tools. What I'm discovering in doing this is that there are different characteristics for different tools. For instance, that RF100 Diver, phenomenal helixing tool cuts pretty close to the same as many of the other tools in the regular iMachining toolpath. I haven't found anything yet that beats it in Helix. Okay, it's just, it's just a phenomenal Helixing tool. But as far as its ability to run the rest of the cut, it's pretty similar to most of the rest of them. Okay, um, unless you get you know in something out of the MSC catalog, you're talking a different story. But you know those are the the low end expense you know inexpensive tools. If you start looking at premium grade carbide tooling from any of the you know recognized manufacturers, they're all going to run pretty similar to each other. Some are going to have a little bit of advantage over the others, and those are things you're going to discover. Those advantages are going to change from one setup to another. The the harmonics on your machine, the spindle quality on your machine, the condition of the spindle on your machine, the condition of the fixturing that you're using, uh, how much tool stick out it can handle. A uh, lot of different factors come into play, but the more that you begin to experiment and study with and do some empirical studies with what you get for results and tools, you can find those combinations that work really, really good. You know, Ken, it, it's such a great point. I mean, you know, every setup is different. Every programmer is different. Everything is, it's never the same. So you have to, you know, kind of take into consideration what you're, you know, how aggressively you want to program. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, everything's different all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's when we talk about post-processors, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, can I get a post for this machine? Well, you know, that's, yeah, sure, you can get a post Absolutely. for that machine, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know as well as I do. Every, <laughs> it's like, do you want your tool, you know, your M01 before, you know, the T2 or, you know, it, it it's, it's all, you know, it's all impartial. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. has their whole thing that, right. and that's the, greatest thing about solid cam is the fact that we we listen to you about that and if you right. want your post to be that way we'll do it for you and it's right. not a problem right. so um, we're running a bit a little, little bit late so um, we're gonna have to wrap this up um, uh, Ken a very great compliment for you great class Ken looking forward to seeing you when you can make it up this way that was from uh, uh, Clarence Wilson so uh, thank you uh, Clarence looking forward to and, seeing you too. Um, I think we're uh, ready to wrap this up, but uh, thank you so much for everybody stopping by, and we certainly appreciate it. And um, this will be recorded. We are recording this, and we will get it up to the uh, the Capcam class YouTube. And uh, again, thank you, Ken, so much for covering this tonight. And we will be talking to everybody very soon. All right, certainly. Everybody have a great night, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Take care.